7800 Beverly Boulevard is home to CBS Television City, and about two miles west down Beverly at 9309 sits Bristol Farms Grocery Store, which in the 70s was one of LA's most legendary restaurants of all time, Chasen's. During the entire run of The Carol Burnett Show, Joe and Carol would bring each week's guest stars to dinner here at Chasen's after the Friday night tapings. They would celebrate Emmy wins here. Really, all sorts of celebratory dinners would be held here. Chasen's, it was one of those restaurants that, even if you weren't familiar with show business or even lived out here, you still heard all about it. Capturing the legacy of Chasen's in a matter of minutes is simply impossible, but in a nutshell, a vaudeville comedian named Dave Chasen was out here in the 30s when he made chili and spare ribs for his pal Frank Capra, who directed It's a Wonderful Life. Frank loved it so much that he convinced Dave to open a little stand, which he did right here on the border of West Hollywood and Beverly Hills in 1936. Well, once word got out that Dorothy Parker visited, it was over, and Chasen's Little Stand grew into Chasen's legendary restaurant. Hollywood's biggest stars made it a staple for 60 years. And if you ask people what Chasen's is most known for, you would get a bunch of different answers. The chili, the banana shortcake, Jimmy Stewart's infamous bachelor party held here, it's also where Ronald Reagan proposed to his future wife, Nancy. The actual booth where that happened is even at Reagan's presidential library. Most people would probably tell you that Chasen's is best known for their annual Oscar after parties, a tradition they held for decades until they closed their doors for good in 1995. Sadly, I never got to experience Chasen's or try their famous chili, which Elizabeth Taylor loved so much that she had it flown to her on set in Rome, where she was filming Cleopatra. And if that doesn't convince you how good it was, Clark Gable had the chili delivered to his deathbed as it was his last meal wish. Hitchcock, Sinatra, Jimmy Stewart, I mean, they all had booths named after them. Jimmy's is even at the Jimmy Stewart Museum in his Pennsylvania hometown. But this is one of my favorite stories. Onetta Johnson, she was the ladies' room attendant here for years. Well, one night in the early 80s, Donna Summer came to a party here for Julio Iglesias, and Onetta confided in Donna that she was exhausted and she just couldn't wait to get home. Well, Donna made a comment about Onetta and how hard she was working for her money. As the words were coming out of Donna's mouth, she knew she had a hit song, and right there, here in Chasen's, she scribbled down a few lines of what would become her number one iconic song, She Works Hard for the Money. She even put Onetta in the music video for the song. But, you know, we could talk about Chasen's for hours, days even, but gotta move on. One thing I will say, though, is that people were outraged when word got out that Chasen's was being torn down, but to Bristol Farms' credit, they kept the exterior facade here on Beverly, which kind of looks the exact same, although the main doors to the restaurant are no longer in use and the great old canopy awning is gone, but this is where all the stars, all the presidents, everyone who ever ate here entered. The main entrance to the grocery store is around in the back, but I don't know, it's kind of fun to walk around on this side and for a brief moment get transported back to Chasen's. Originally, they were going to put a strip mall here, but the zoning didn't work out or something, so the grocery store moved in, allowing for a lot of the building to remain intact. Chasen's, it was one of those great, old, dark, smoky steakhouse restaurants with a wide open floor plan that had these great big red booths. And before it was gutted, they held an auction and just about everything sold. The staff, most of them lifers, I mean, a handful still working since the 30s, remained with Chasen's till its final day. There was a documentary, a few books have been written about Chasen's. It's truly an integral piece of LA's history, and thankfully, 
Bristol Farms has kept a portion of Chasen's intact on the inside. They kept a few booths and some of the original paneling and have made it their in-store cafe. If you're a big fan of old Hollywood restaurants like I am, you just have no choice but to come check it out. I mean, although I wish Chasen's was still here, it's pretty terrific to still get to experience a little bit of history. When you read lists of regulars here, Carol Burnett's name is usually tossed in. It was very well known that she'd be here on Friday nights. The paparazzi would catch her. Well, the paparazzi, they were always here on the sidewalk. It didn't matter what night it was, really. I mean, stars frequented the place at all hours and times, but it's just funny because while Carol was still a huge fan of showbiz folks, she was now officially one of them. In fact, even bigger than some of the people she grew up idolizing. And I guarantee you that at this point in the 70s, she was getting preferred tables here at Chasen's over most celebrities. Carol Burnett was a household name by the early and mid 70s, and the show was only growing. I always looked forward to having Carol Channing as a guest on our show. She made every straight line funny and every funny line funnier. She also had a reputation for never missing a show when she worked on Broadway. 2,844 performances in Hello, Dolly! alone. She never, ever got sick. She said she owed her remarkable health to what she ate. Joe and I took Carol out to dinner at Chasen's one night after one of her appearances on our show, and she ordered a plate with nothing on it to be delivered to the table. That done, she reached down into a picnic cooler she had brought with her, unwrapped a slab of raw blubber, and slapped it down on the plate. I figured she must know something because it sure worked for her. However, I wasn't about to give it a whirl myself. We booked Carol for another guest appearance the following season. That Monday morning before the reading with the cast and writers, we got a call from Carol's husband saying she was under the weather and couldn't make it in that day, but not to worry, she'd definitely be fine come Tuesday. I wondered what was wrong. Carol was there, as promised, the next morning, bright-eyed as could be. I asked her how she felt. Oh, darling, I'm fine, just fine. Her smile, as usual, was a mile wide. Well, what happened, Carol? Well, we were playing Vegas last week, and I had this frozen elk flown in. Frozen elk? Yes, and you know, it just hit me the wrong way. Boy, did I learn a lesson. She leaned in close to me and took my hand. Those huge eyes were glued to my face and staring at me very seriously. We were nose to nose. And she said in that low voice of hers, Carol, you must listen to me and don't ever forget this. I nodded. Now, whenever you're on the road, you must never eat just any old elk. I've managed to keep that promise to this day. This is crazy. In the early days of Chasen's, actually, for quite some time, they wouldn't take credit card payment. They wouldn't take payments. They had so many loyal regulars that they just kept a running tab, and then they would bill the customers at the end of each month or whenever. Chasen's also, they never spent money on advertising or publicity at all, just seemed to happen naturally through the presence of celebrities. Oh, and also, pretty much every president after Roosevelt up through Bill Clinton ate here. But in the late 80s and early 90s, trendier restaurants opened up around town, and Chasen's just, they weren't doing the same business. Um, we're here pretty early. That's why it's so empty in here. But by lunchtime, this place will be pretty busy. But before we go, I wanted to tell you one other story that pertains to Carol. Remember Barbara and Madeline, those gorgeous sisters who attended LeConte with Carol? The ones she would just stare at, wishing she could be as beautiful as she thought they were? Well, one night, Carol was here at Chasen's. I think she was celebrating an Emmy win. But she spotted Barbara in a nearby booth. I mean, they hadn't seen each other since junior high, but all of those old feelings came rushing back as Carol tried to avoid her. 
But as she was leaving, she felt a hand on her arm and turned to see Barbara. Oh, hi, Carol. I know you don't know who I am, and I'm sure you don't remember me, but my name is Barbara, and you're not going to believe this, but we actually went to LeConte Junior High together. Now you live, don't you, do you live in the old Betty Grable house? Yes. In California? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Are there mementos or mementi of Betty Grable? Around? No, no. Uh, God love her. She was on our show uh, the first year we were on. And um, she came to see our house and um, had a drink with us and walked through and she got very teary eyed. And uh, it was just a thrill to see her in the house and that we lived there because yeah. she was one of my favorites and a wonderful woman. Was she? Oh, funny, funny sense of humor. And she was never this movie star kind of a lady. She said, listen, I know what it's like and so forth. And she worked very mm -hmm. hard and, and never took the stardom she had that seriously. In 1976, after the ninth season of The Carol Burnett Show, Joe and Carol decided they needed a residential change. It's not that they didn't love the old Betty Grable mansion. They spent a decade living in it together, raising their three beautiful daughters. But the truth is, it had become ruined by tourists. Now you have the internet, but back in the day, star maps, they were huge, and when Carol's address was published, it became a nightmare for the Hamilton family. It's one thing to drive by a house in Gawk, but there were fans not only ringing the doorbell, but several had actually entered the home, some of them demanding tours. One time, one of the girls came down to the kitchen for breakfast and found a family from Ohio eating their food. Carol, she was one of the highest paid actors on TV, and her fame was at an all-time high. But they weren't going to leave this house quietly. In fact, they had a very publicized garage sale. <laughs> okay, so obviously I film these tours, and then I go home and add all of the media that you see. But today, <laughs> we have the media with us. This is ju it's just one of my favorite magazine covers of all time. I mean, you know I fell in love with Carol in high school. Well, I found this in a thrift store right after I read her book and bought it for like a quarter or something, and I've had it ever since. I think it's just art. I'm serious. I love it so much. I wish People Magazine had covers like this today, or even just issues like this, covering garage sales. But this just wasn't any garage sale. It was a black tie affair, invitation only, because all of the money was going to cancer research. The Hamiltons opened their home up and sold all of their stuff, and Hollywood just showed up. Roddy McDowell, Phyllis Diller, Tim Conway even joked that the Hamiltons were selling all of our Christmas presents to them. I'm <laughs> so afraid someone I know is going to drive by and be like, Justin, are you carrying old Carol Burnett magazines through Beverly Hills? Uh, I brought another one, though. I love it. I actually have a large collection of old, great classic magazines. This one was from 1971 when Mrs. Joe Hamilton, alias Carol Burnett, appeared on the cover. It talks about Joe and Carol living here and how it was the first house Carol owned. It even shows a few rare photos of the inside. But what's so special about this to me is that my grandmother kept this magazine for over 20 years in her basement and when she found out how much i loved carol she let me have it and i just love that her name and address are on it carol in the current issue of tv guide uh you've read the story no doubt the vivian welton story you're not familiar with no it? i haven't gotten about the, the new issue well it's a story about this lady who sells the movie star maps and she oh. has Yes, and she has quotes from you in there uh -huh. about, you know, the people who come traipsing through oh, your house. Oh, yeah, that's awful. Now, Carol, I was, you know, I've been around stars in the business a long time. I was absolutely shocked to think that people come storming into your house they demanding do. a tour. Yes. No, well, that's happened to us a couple of times. And then they, you know, ring the doorbell and, and uh, say, well, we drove from Ohio or, you know, Kansas City or wherever. And... Uh, really expect to come in you know now I do believe that a performer 
is uh, open to the public and as much as we do ask for uh, their approval, for the public's approval, we do want to be loved and everything, but there does come a time when you really, you know, once you're home, I do think that uh, any human being is entitled to the privacy of his own home. When you're out on the street and you meet people, then I think you should uh, meet them and be nice about it and everything. But Hello. But when they, uh, you know, ring the doorbell, I wouldn't do that to a stranger or to, you know, to anybody, you know, unless I was asked. I don't think these maps help any, you know, and I would like to see that discontinued. Yeah, she says in the story quote she was saying you wish the maps would be outlawed. I do, yes. I wrote the governor about it in California, and he said there's just no way. He says, move. <laughs> you know. Well, are you? I probably will. <laughs> Right off of Sunset Boulevard down there, situated about in the middle, right between the Doheny Mansion and the Beverly Hills Hotel, is Alpine Drive, and it is where the Hamilton family moved after they sold their Doheny home. It's all the way at the top of Alpine, and we're actually going to walk all the way up. Don't worry, I don't have my magazines. They're in the car. I just wanted you to see this whole street because it is so gorgeous and also so quiet these trees too. Um, it's apparently sometimes called Billionaire's Row, one of many Billionaire's Rows in LA. There's a mix of just huge, huge mansions, mostly hidden behind gates and hedges, and then some slightly more modest ones like this one where Oscar winner Donna Reed lived until she died here in 1986. And when the Hamiltons moved to this street in 76, Don Rickles complained about all of the tour buses coming up here. Carol cracked back to him, eh, sorry, Don, guess they didn't really have a reason to drive up here till now. <laughs> so good. And this was his house, and he eventually moved out. <laughs> sorry, I know I'm going fast, but it's a long way up, and I'm just realizing it's uphill, and I'm probably going to be out of breath soon, so I don't want to stop. And I have to tell you all about Carol's badass actions of 1976. At the start of the year in January, she was in Washington, D.C. having dinner at a restaurant. She had a couple glasses of wine with dinner, and on her way out, she stopped by Henry Kissinger's table to say a quick hello. He was Secretary of State under Ford at the time and had just been part of the whole Watergate scandal with Nixon a couple years before. Crazy, though, he's actually still alive and close to turning 100. But apparently, Carol is drawn to Secretary of State people. You had John Foster Dulles and now Kissinger. Anyway, a couple months later in March, the trash tabloid National Enquirer ran a piece saying that, actually, I wrote it down so that I could read it verbatim. Hold on here. Okay, they wrote, in a Washington restaurant, a boisterous Carol Burnett had a loud argument with another diner, Henry Kissinger. Then she traipsed around the place offering everyone a bite of her dessert, but Carol really raised eyebrows when she accidentally knocked a glass of wine over one diner and started giggling instead of apologizing. The guy wasn't amused and accidentally spilled a glass of water over Carol's dress. Okay. First of all, if Carol Burnett traipsed around a restaurant offering me dessert, I would lose my mind. That would feel like the universe giving me just the greatest gift of all time. And then if she spilled wine on me, forget about it. The cherry on top. What a perfect evening. <laughs> anyway, someone sold this story to the Inquirer, probably saw that she had some wine glasses on the table, and then stopped to chat with Kissinger. I'm sure she laughed. She's fun. She's outgoing. And bam, the Inquirer had a story. Well, Carol wasn't happy, rightfully so, and she called them out. They printed a retraction saying that it didn't actually happen, but Carol was like, nah, you know, not good enough. So she sued them for like $1.6 million. No one had done this before. It was a landmark case. Celebs had badmouthed the tabloid, but nobody, they had never taken them to court. Nobody thought they would win. And, you know, all these First Amendment rights. But it was really important for Carol to make a point. I mean, if you've watched this entire tour, you know that alcoholism was a major theme throughout her life. This, it was a personal attack. And Carol was going to prove to the courts that there was malice behind it and that the Inquirer knew it was a lie. 
Well, it took a long time. She got tied up in the legal drama of it all. But again, this wasn't about the money. This was about the principle, the morality behind it. Carol, she wasn't a heavy drinker, and she wanted to make sure that the world knew that. So it took a long time, but it actually went to trial. People could not believe it had gotten that far. And in March of 1981, the court ordered Carol Burnett be paid $1.6 million in damages. The money was eventually reduced to like two or $300,000, but Carol didn't care. She told the press she would have been just as happy with a dollar in parking validation. She just wanted the victory, and she got it. It was unprecedented. Nobody had ever beaten the Inquirer like that. And she donated her settlement to promote ethics and journalism. All right, while I catch my breath, check out the ruins of this house being demolished. No idea who or what it was all about. Probably some great classic house being replaced by some hideous Cheesecake Factory-looking mansion. Mmm, Cheesecake Factory. <laughs> all right. We're almost at the top, and I want to tell you about Carol's next movie. We know she wasn't having the best outcome when it came to films, but in 1977, she put word out that she wanted to work with brilliant, brilliant director Robert Altman. Her pal Lily Tomlin told her that he was the best director, and that if anyone could get her to loosen up in front of a film camera, it was him. Altman loved the idea, and Carol signed on to do the movie without even seeing a script or knowing what the part was. It didn't matter. It was Robert Altman. Nashville, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, MASH. Well, Carol was living here when she packed up the girls and flew them to Chicago in the summer of 77, where she would join an all-star, stellar cast in Altman tradition, and make a gem of a forgotten movie, a fascinating movie, a strange movie, a 70s movie, a funny movie, a weird movie, a wedding. Guess who Robert Altman and 20th Century Fox have invited to a wedding? Carol Burnett, Mia Farrow, Geraldine Chaplin, Desi Arnaz Jr., Vittorio Gossman, Dina Merrill, Lauren Hutton, Lillian Gish, Howard Duff. A nervous nurse, a senile bishop, a happy mother, a lost family, a fight, a fall, a reunion, an accident, a stampede, infidelity, passion, romance, all come together in a wedding to end all weddings. Rated PG, now playing at a theater near you. Check newspapers. A Wedding has the wildest tidbits. Not only did it feature about 50 roles, but listen to the list of actors who were background extras at the start of their careers. John Malkovich, Gary Sinise, Joan Allen, George Went, and Laurie Metcalf, all Chicago actors. Also, the church in the film is the same church where Macaulay Culkin gets a heart-to-heart -heart visit with his not-so-scary old man neighbor in Home Alone. And the house in the film was later purchased by Richard Marks and his wife, Cynthia Rhodes, in 1997. The movie took eight weeks to film, and Carol went into it with some advice she got after having had dinner with Anthony Hopkins. Seriously, try to imagine that dinner. But he told her to take chances, take risks, don't be afraid to look stupid. Well, she took those words to heart, and Altman also had a conversation with her, and he knew some of her issues working on her previous films, and he basically said to her, look, you're looking at it all wrong. You're overthinking it. You're overcomplicating it. You think movie making is a big deal. It's not. This, after all, was a director who, he made movies with basically an outline, not scripts, bullet points here and there. He wrote his movies as he went. He just gave so much creative freedom to his actors. They were encouraged to ad-lib, to improvise. He gave them all notebooks with basic plot points of what would happen to each character, but he let them fill in the rest. Well, the movie came out, and critics and audiences were mixed, but that didn't matter. Carol was a different actor now. She was free, she was loose, and she had the best time making it, and she was also rewarded with a Supporting Actress Golden Globe nomination. All right, let's keep moving. We're almost at the top where Carol's second house is, and it's just as mysterious as the Doheny house. Not because it's gone like that one, but because it isn't. It's still here, but there just aren't... I can't find any photos of it anywhere, and there's really not much information about it out there. And you're all going to get so mad at me when you realize I brought us all the way up here to 
basically just stare at a driveway, but that's just the way Joe and Carol designed it to be completely private and off limits. Their move also made headlines because the house was custom built with a price tag of $2 million. I mean, celebrities were known to live in million dollar homes back then, but $2 million? Pretty rare. It's also hilarious considering it's probably worth eight times that now or 10 times, who knows how much. But good for Joe and Carol. Good, good, good for them. I love it. They deserved it. She deserved it. Every millionth square foot of it. It's really, I mean, it's breathtaking to think about this little girl growing up, not that far from here, in a one-room apartment in a not-so-desirable area of Hollywood and ending up here from sheer hard work and determination and tenacity. All right, so... These driveways split off into four different properties, as you can tell by the addresses, and the Hamiltons was over here at 985 on the left, and McCall's Magazine did an interview from the home, and they said it had not one, but two tennis courts, as well as an Olympic-sized pool, and supposedly one of the grandest staircases in all of Beverly Hills. McCall's also said that it had the largest living room they had ever seen, and, oh, I'm sure the views had to be just out of this world. I mean, we are on top of one of Beverly's hills, and it's a really corny cliche, but career-wise, Carol was, she was sitting on top of the world. One of the very first events in the new house was Carol's sister Chrissy's wedding, she had a brief marriage to actor Will Sugarfoot Hutchins in the mid-60s, but that didn't last long. And her second wedding was held here in the Hamilton Gardens. It was also reported in People Magazine that the new house had a yoga studio where friends like Maggie Smith, Paul Newman, and Joanne Woodward would stop by for weekly classes. Yoga. Hot sweaty yoga with Paul Newman. Well, I guess Carol's yoga classes is my answer for where I'd have a time machine take me. And, oh my god, the dinner parties Joe and Carol must have had here? I have to say, I looked this house up on Google Earth. I mean, it's public. Anyone can. And it's like watching the opening credits to Dynasty or something. <laughs> Lucille Ball had a reputation for being tough. There were times on the set when she'd say things to someone on the crew or to the writers that could have been considered blunt, to say the least, but she was always right. She never censored her opinions or couched them euphemistically. She called it the way she saw it, and if she didn't like something, she'd let you know. And if she did like something, she was as complimentary as could be. That's why the crew and staff loved her. She was honest, and none of the criticism was ever personal. In those days, though, it was unheard of for a woman to run a show, let alone run it like a man. All of the greats, Caesar, Burl, Gleason, etc., could say whatever they very well pleased, and their reputations remained intact. They were tough, and that was to be expected. But a woman being tough? There was a name for that, and it wasn't complimentary. Once I had my own variety show, Lucy and I would do trade-offs. I'd go on one of her shows, and she would guest star on one of mine. Well, we became very close friends. She always sent me flowers on my birthday, and I would always save the card. One week, when she was on our show, we went across the street to a Chinese restaurant in the farmer's market before the evening orchestra rehearsal. The two of us slid into a booth, and as we were perusing the menu... She looked at me and said, Kid, you're so lucky to have Joe producing your show, running interference, being the bad cop. I agreed with her. It wasn't in my nature to be the boss. I was a first-class chicken. 
When I didn't care for a comedy sketch, I couldn't come right out and say it wasn't working. No, no. I would say to the writers, gosh, guys, it's not your fault. I'm just not doing this right. Can you help me? Maybe come up with a different line or two. I'm really sorry. Joe would simply say, this isn't working. It's not funny. Fix it. I could never do that. Those words would stick in my throat. So yes, Lucy was correct in her assessment of how our show was being run. You know, she continued, when I was married to the Cuban, I never had to worry about a thing. Desi was so damn smart about everything. Scripts, cameras, lighting, costuming, you name it. I would simply waltz in on Monday mornings and the cast and I would read a perfect script all ready for rehearsal. All I had to do was be Lucy. Desi took care of the rest. We made a great team. Plus, it didn't hurt that we were crazy about each other, just like you and Joe. We ordered, and then we were quiet for a while. She lit up a cigarette, and then she chuckled. You know, after Desi and I parted, it was all on my shoulders. I Love Lucy was over. Now I was Lucy in a different format for CBS. I had a great sidekick in Gail Gordon. I had a great time slot. So far, so good. Oh, all I needed was a great show. She got quiet again. The egg rolls arrived. She put out her cigarette and took a bite of an egg roll. We chewed for a bit, and then she continued. I remember the Monday morning when I went to the studio for our first rehearsal, and ta-da, guess what? The script stank. I mean, it stank. I was thrown, but good. I needed to catch my breath, so I suggested that we all take a break and come back after lunch. I sat in my office trying to figure out what to do, how to handle the situation. Could the Lucy I'd always been be able to actually run a show? Would anybody listen to her? I knew I had to turn into Desi, be fearless, or there'd be no show. She paused and went on. I got back to the writer's room after lunch and sat in the big black leather chair at the head of the conference table. Everyone was quiet. You could have heard a pin drop. I opened up and told them what I thought about the script in no uncertain terms. No pussyfooting around. They got the picture and went back to work in a hurry. She lit another cigarette and smiled. And that kid is when they added the S to the end of my last name. I laughed right through the kumquats. I miss her. She died early on the morning of my birthday in 1989, and I got my flowers and the card from her that afternoon. Lucille Ball, as we've learned, really had a lot of influence in Carol's world. The very first few seasons of The Carol Burnett Show, they're fun, but you see a very green Carol, very new, slightly unsure, and the whole, oh, shucks thing around sexy Lyle Wagner. But by the mid-70s, this, this woman emerged. Carol, she had a confidence about her, an overall stronger vibe. The skits became a little bit more meaningful. They had more of a direction, more of a point. Carol had become more of a feminist, too, and that showed. All the changes that were happening only caused the show to grow better and become even more popular. And it wasn't just Carol that the world fell in love with. The cast was thriving. And in fact, there finally became a new permanent addition. People assume that Tim Conway was in on it from the get-go. Not so. He was a regular guest one or two times a month until the ninth year when, duh, how stupid were we, We finally asked him to be on every single week. Tim was a true original, with a comedic mind so brilliant it's downright scary. His sketches with Harvey deserve a spot in whatever cultural time capsule we're setting aside for future generations. We always take two shows on Fridays with two different audiences. The early show was a dress rehearsal that we taped as a backup. Tim would do the first show as written, To the Ink. Then, as we were getting ready for the next show, he would check in with our director, Dave Powers. You get all the shots? Dave would respond, yes. Well, he always got all the shots. Tim would then ask Dave to change some things for the second show. For instance, 
Uh, Dave, instead of shooting a close-up of me when I go to the window in the hotel sketch, could you make it a head-to-toe shot? This meant that Tim had come up with some outrageous bit of business that we hadn't seen or planned for. Now the fun would begin. Whatever Tim had been secretly cooking up all week blossomed into sheer hysterics in the second show, with Dave and the camera crew winging it right alongside him. 99% of the time, we aired the second taping with all of Tim's ad-libs and improvisations because they were so much funnier than the ink that we'd planned. Tim's dentist sketch with Harvey has to go down in television history as one of the funniest bits ever. Tim played the dentist fresh out of school, and Harvey was his very first patient. The meat of the sketch was that Tim kept accidentally shooting himself with Novocaine, first in his hand, then in his leg, and finally winding up with the needle between his eyebrows. As usual, he came up with most of these bits himself, and we all saw them for the first time in the second show. I was screaming with laughter watching the monitor in my dressing room, so I ran out to the backstage area and watched from the wings. The entire audience was exploding. Our cameramen couldn't contain themselves either. Well, there wasn't a dry eye or seat in the house. And then I looked at Harvey. He couldn't move from his chair, utterly helpless with laughter. He tried his best to keep it together, but it was no use. Tears were sp- burning out of his eyes. Tim was relentless. Tim didn't just improvise, though. He wrote a lot of the sketches we did. Mr. Tudball and Mrs. Wiggins were his creations, for instance, and we trusted his instincts, and we were never wrong. Tim Conway is fearless in his comedy. If the audience doesn't get it at first, he keeps on keeping on until they do. Unfortunately, our show has been accused of showing actors cracking up at times, breaking character. Guilty as charged. But it was never unwarranted. I dare anyone to be on camera and to keep it together when Conway gets on a roll. We really tried. We tried very, very hard not to break up. But when we did, it was honest. Tim received nine Emmy nominations and won three Emmys for his work on The Carol Burnett Show. And the rest of the cast had really grown as well. Harvey Korman was a huge star. He appeared, of course, in Mel Brooks' 1974 masterpiece, Blazing Saddles. And for a minute there, his ego grew to be the size of his stardom, and Carol fired him. It was during the week when Petula Clark was the guest star, and he was basically rude to her. Carol took him aside and said, Look, be rude to me all you want. I don't care. But you will not be rude to one of our guest stars. Absolutely not. You're off the show. Don't come back until you're Mr. Happy-Go-Lucky. Well, apparently, Harvey got drunk at a bar that night and yelled to everyone who would listen all about Carol firing him. But the truth was, he really respected her for it. And the following week, he showed back up at work, and when Carol passed him in the hallway, he was whistling, smiling, singing, and he even put a sign over his dressing room door that said, Mr. Happy-Go-Lucky. Well, from that point on, everything was fine, until Harvey decided to actually leave the show himself after the 10th season in 1977. After seven Emmy nominations and four wins, including one in which fellow nominee and loser Tim Conway followed him up on stage. Uh, When I was in the fifth grade, I decided to be an actor, and I'm very glad that I did to be associated with with television. Despite all the revolts and the detractors, I think we accomplished a lot of good. (laughs) To to be associated with Joe Hamilton and Dave Powers, Eddie Simmons, and all our wonderful writers, Vicki Lawrence, and of course, the great lady without all of this would be a fantasy without her, my darling Carol and to also to get a chance to work with idiots like this. Thank you very much. 
The most growth, though, had to have come from Vicki Lawrence. This child who wrote a fan letter to Carol Burnett ended up creating just a terrific career for herself. Yeah, she was a little stiff in the beginning. Her lack of experience showed, but she blossomed into a hell of a performer. And in 1973, Vicki became a pop star. She released an album with a song that reached number one here in America and Canada. That's the night that the lights went out in Georgia. That's the night that they hung an innocent man. Well, don't trust your soul and old backwoods southern lawyer. Cause the judge in the town's got blood stains on his head. But it wasn't until the seventh season when a new sketch was introduced that Vicky hit her stride and cemented herself as a legend in television. The Family was a new sketch written by Jenna McMahon and Dick Clare, and it featured the older matriarch of a blue-collar family that included her daughter Eunice and her husband Ed. The sketch was written with Carol in mind to play the matriarch, known as Mama, and Vicky and Harvey would play Eunice and Ed. Well, during rehearsals, Carol found herself more drawn to Eunice, and Bob Mackey suggested that Vicky should play Mama. Carol was into it and also decided to give Eunice a southern accent, which changed the entire premise of the skit. Well, the writers were not happy with the changes at first, but as time went on, everyone saw that the new changes worked magnificently. Vicky as Mama was, it was inspired genius. The second that costume and that wig hit Vicky, she knocked it out of the park. She turned into an entirely different actor and she became Mama. It's impossible to think of anyone else doing that role. And Carol as Eunice, I think, honestly, it's my favorite character that she does on the show. There's just this haunting parallel between Eunice and Carol's own mama. They both had giant aspirations, huge dreams that were not only shattered for multiple reasons, but those broken dreams would be on full blast and constantly thrown back in their faces by their cantankerous, cranky old spitfire mothers. Sounds familiar, right? Well, you would think Carol created and wrote these characters based on the similarities. You'd think that she was playing Louise and that Vicky was playing Mama, you know, Nanny Mama. While she didn't write the sketches, she sure brought years and years of experience to the role and it showed. These characters were not only hilarious, but they were real, they were human. And what I love about all of the family sketches is there are times where, where it just time goes by without any jokes or laughs or gags. I know it's a comedy show, but there was so much drama and so much heart in these sketches and characters. And something worth noting, Vicky never wore old age makeup to play Mama. None. It just worked. Carol, like I mentioned, hated to make the audience wait, so it was crucial that Vicky could slip into Mama's wardrobe fast and easy between sketches. No time for old age makeup, and Vicky more than pulled it off. She created one of television's greatest characters. It's no wonder that it's become one of the most popular sketches from the show, and that Vicky herself would receive five Emmy nominations for her work on The Carol Burnett Show, winning one. Vicky Lawrence, The Carol Burnett Show! Shoot, I don't believe it. <laughs> Better late than never. Uh, Oh, I want to thank uh, everybody in the Academy, and I want to thank everybody connected with The Burnett Show for all of their support and guidance, and Harvey, especially my dialectician. And uh, I want to thank my husband, Al, for his love and encouragement, and Carol especially. There's nobody on earth I'd rather look like. Thank you. This portion of the tour <laughs> has me so stressed out for several reasons. First of all, I tried so hard to get us into CBS, onto Stage 33, 
to see where all of this magic happened. But with the new ownership, CBS Television City is apparently no longer what it used to be, although a handful of my friends tried so hard to make it happen. We couldn't pull it off. And second, I just want to tell you about every single sketch and every single guest star and all of the fun stories, but it is impossible to pack 11 seasons worth of this magnificent show into a segment of this tour. So I'll just mention some, like the movie takeoffs. From the get-go, Carol loved to spoof the movies that she grew up loving, and it became a huge part of the show, some of the sketches lasting the entire episode. One of my favorites was when she would play Nora Desmond, not Norma, spoofing Sunset Boulevard with Harvey brilliantly playing Max, absolutely hilarious, even winning over the heart of the original Norma Desmond, Gloria Swanson. Gloria, she wasn't the only film legend who loved and respected Carol. Several of her childhood idols became massive Carol Burnett fans, including my favorite, Joan Crawford. Joan, she never guest starred on Carol's show, but Carol spoofed Mildred Pierce, in her version, Mildred Fierce, and it's just one of her best characters. And she even sort of developed, well, some sort of relationship with Joan. There was a letter waiting for me. It had been forwarded from my agent's office. The envelope was handwritten, and when I turned it over to look at the back, there was a return address and a signature Joan Crawford. Joan Crawford? I tore it open. The letter was also handwritten. Darling Carol, I've been a fan of yours for a long time. It's always wonderful when good things happen to people you love. Sincerely, Joan. I was dumbfounded. Joan Crawford. Wow, she was a queen. I thought about answering her. I didn't want to seem forward, but I really wanted to express my gratitude for such a lovely letter. Dear Miss Crawford, thank you so very much for your kind words. I was thrilled to hear from you. I'll save your letter forever. Your fan, Carol Burnett. A week went by, and another letter arrived. Darling Carol, I received your very sweet letter, and I'm planning on saving it the way you're saving mine. Hope all is well, and I send you much love. And please, no more of this Miss Crawford crap. Yours, Joan. Should I write back? I wasn't sure what to do. Okay, I decided one last time. Dear Joan, thank you for asking me to call you Joan. I'm most honored. I hope to meet you in person someday. With love, Carol. The following week, darling Carol, I'm so glad you feel comfortable calling me Joan. I, too, hope we can meet in person someday. Life can be so short, but also wonderful. Don't you think so? Love, Joan. I was at a loss. I didn't want to be rude, but I felt somewhat awkward having Joan Crawford as a pen pal. I relayed this to a few other people in the business and heard back that Joan Crawford wrote lots of letters to lots of people. I decided not to write anymore, hoping she'd still like me. A couple of years later, Joe and I went to the Four Seasons restaurant in New York for dinner. It was a beautiful room, at the center of which was, and still is, a large, lighted, shallow pool with tables surrounding it. While the maitre d' was checking our reservation, I looked around, and there, at the nearest table, in a seat next to the pool with three other folks, was Joan. Joe, I whispered urgently. There's Joan Crawford. What do we do? What do you mean? I never answered her last letter. Oh, God, maybe she won't see us. Looking straight ahead, we made it past her table, and then we heard her voice. Carol? We turned around. She stood up, reached across the table for my hand. I gave it to her. Well, hi, Miss Crawford. No, 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 dear, it's Joan. Introductions were made all around. She gave Joe and me a big hug. I felt better. She wasn't holding a grudge. We made our way across the room where Joe and I were seated at a table for two next to the pool. The waiter handed out the menus. I glanced across the pool and saw Joan Crawford staring at me. I smiled, and she blew me a kiss. Joe, she blew me a kiss. Joe said, well, blow one back. I did, 
and then she blew another one. Joe, it's like the letters. We'll be blowing kisses all night. Joe, ever the voice of reason, said, then don't look across the pool. Dinner came and went, and I hadn't once glanced across the pool. I finally sneaked a peek and saw that her table was being cleared by a busboy. Whew! I turned back to Joe and saw his eyes looking straight past my right shoulder and down at the floor. I turned around, and there was Joan Crawford next to my chair on her knees. Carol, darling, it's so wonderful to meet you in person after all these years. Uh, thank you, Miss Crawford. I looked around. Nobody seemed to notice. Please, uh, get up. She didn't. She just stayed there on the floor on her knees. No, no, it's Joan. Joan, please, please, get up. I'm fine right here. She wasn't budging. She took my hand and put it to her cheek. I am so happy for this evening. We told her that we were too. Joe took her hand and helped her up, and she gave him a dazzling smile. Years later, on my variety show, we did a takeoff on Mildred Pierce called Mildred Fierce after Joan Crawford had won an Oscar for the role. Bob Mackey had outfitted me in a pinstripe suit with enormous shoulder pads, which was a brilliant recreation of her look in that movie. After our sketch aired, I got a letter from her. I loved it. You gave it more production than that effing Jack Warner. Thus began another round of correspondence. And, of course, we have to mention the most iconic sketch from the entire series and probably one of the most famous sketches in the history of sketch comedy that, believe it or not, became what it did thanks to costume designer Bob Mackey. Then there was the Wednesday when I went in for the Gone with the Wind fitting. Our takeoff was called Went with the Wind. I was playing Starlet O'Hara. It was a brilliant send-up of the movie with Harvey playing Rat Butler. There's a classic scene in the movie when Scarlet takes the green velvet draperies with the golden tie tassels down from the window and has Mammy make a dress for her so that she can impress Rhett. In our written version, when Rat is waiting at the bottom of the stairs for Starlet's entrance, I was to appear at the top of the stairs with the draperies simply hanging there on my body as I descended to greet Rat Butler. Funny enough, I mean, I was sure to get a good laugh. However, when I walked into the fitting room, Bob said, I have an idea for the drapery bit. Then he brought out the dress. It was a green velvet gown still attached to the curtain rod that would fit across my shoulders with golden curtain tassels tied at the waist. He'd even made a hat out of the rest of the tassels while I fell on the floor. That Friday taping will go down in history. When Starlet appeared at the top of the stairs, in that getup, the audience went crazy. It's been called one of the funniest moments in the history of television comedy, and it was all because of Bob. Today, his spectacular creation is on view at the Smithsonian. That, that, that gown is gorgeous. <laughs> Thank you. I saw it in the window, and I just couldn't resist it. <laughs> Oh, there were so many great, great moments with the audience, too, like when an old lady who was a regular at the tapings got Carol involved with her seat. Hi, Mrs. Miller. What do I have to know to get a front seat? <laughs> Who do you have to know to get a front seat? What happened? You didn't get a front seat today. No. Okay, I'm sorry. Maybe we'll get you a, a front seat next week, I'll okay? Yes, ma'am. I'll, I'll trade with Mrs. You'll Miller. You'll trade with Mrs. Miller? Sure. This lady in the red down here said she'll trade with you, Mrs. Miller. She's sticking out quite a way here. Would you like to do that? Mrs. Miller, why don't you come down here? What's your name? Roxanne. Roxanne, that's very nice of you. Come on, Mrs. Miller. Oh, you brought her. Oh, 
Oh, right. Yes, we must get that. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, Mrs. Miller. If Roxanne was down here and you can see better down here. This is my husband. Hello. <laughs> One time Asher, remember Asher who Carol teased so much in the neighborhood gang? He and his wife came to a taping. One time someone told Carol they lived by her longtime crush. <laughs> from the time I was about 12 years old up through the time I was 17, which was about 10 years ago. <laughs> I had always loved Tommy Tracy, and I always dreamed that someday we'd get married and I'd have two children, and I'd name them Stacy Tracy and Dick Tracy. <laughs> oh, I want to go on and on, but there are so many. Oddly enough, teenagers saturated the audience. Carol's show was so hip and cool for the times, and <laughs> there were countless young boys raising their hands, either asking Carol her measurements or if they could take her to dinner. With Harvey not returning for the 11th season, they tried to find an adequate replacement in the form of Dick Van Dyke. While Dick is an incredible performer, one of the best, one of the funniest, he just didn't fit in with the rest of the cast. Carol, she always felt like he was way too big of a star to join their show this late in the game, especially playing Second Banana. She even suggested the show change its name to include his, but CBS said no. He didn't last long, his style of comedy, it just didn't lend itself to the sketch format and his heart just wasn't in it. But nonetheless, CBS wanted the Carol Burnett show back for a 12th season. However, Carol did not. There had been a lot of chatter as to why she wanted to end the show. Many people thought it was because Harvey was gone. Others said it was perhaps personal reasons at home. But the truth was, Carol wanted to leave while they were still on top. And after 11 seasons, 11, the Carol Burnett Show said goodbye for the last time on March 29th, 1978. And it included a surprise that Oh my gosh, makes me absolutely ball. You know, I, I hate to kind of uh, interrupt here, but you know, uh, you have a favorite performer, and uh, the guy's been here every week with his piano, and uh, you've never let him on the show. And uh, I think at this time, it, since it's the last show and everything, I'd like to take the opportunity to give the guy a break. So, do you mind? Excuse me. The roughest, toughest man by far is ragtime cowboy Joe. He can sing jazz music to the cattle as they swing. Back and forward in the saddle on a horse, a pretty good horse, with the syncopated gate and the roar of his repeater. It has such a funny meter, how they run. When he fires that gun, so the western folks all know that he's an eye for lootin', rootin', tootin', son of a gun from Arizona. Ragtime cowboy, talk about your cowboy. Ragtime cowboy joke. my favorite actor for so many years. I, I have talked about him. I have worshipped him. I, I can't believe that you... This 
It's, um, this is an evening of mixed emotions for me. Like graduation, it's a uh, sad and a happy time. It can't be possible that it was 1967 when Harvey, Vicki, Lyle, and I stepped on this stage for the first time because it does seem as if it were only yesterday. Those cliches really have a habit of uh, punching you in the nose, don't they? Recently, um, a lot of people have been running around and expressing their own opinions as to why I decided to quit at the end of this season. And I think I should be the one to tell you, seeing as how I'm the one who really knows. In our 11 years, we have had four different time slots, and we've had our share of being up there in the ratings and being down there in the ratings. And ratings do not have a thing to do with my decision. If they did, I would have called a halt to the proceedings a long time ago because there have been many, many times when they've been a lot lower than they've been this season. Now, I do think it's classier to leave before you're asked to. And the fact that CBS picked our show up for a 12th year and was quite adamant about it is very flattering to all of us here on the show. However, I am adamant too, and I, I am so proud of our show, and quite simply, I'm no dummy. Now is the time to put it to bed and to go on to other things because change is growth. It's hard because all of us around here truly did become a second family. We've been through marriages and divorces and deaths and births. And I know the love that we have shared can never be measured by time. Our first director, Clark Jones, our first year, just wonderful. Dave Powers, who's been our director the past 10 years, and he is going on to other things. He's going to, uh, to direct Three's Company next year. I would like to thank uh, our various producers, Arnie Rosen, Bill Angelus, Buzz Cohan, our present producer, Ed Simmons, our executive producer, Joe Hamilton, whom I happen to love very much, our technical crew, our stage hands, the gang upstairs in the office, our entire creative staff are the best anybody could have ever had. I know they know all of the love and admiration I have for each and every one of them. No one could feel more grateful than I do tonight for having had the opportunity to work with and learn from the brilliant talent of Harvey Corman, who has no creative limits. And we have all watched Vicki Lawrence blossom and grow from a green kid just out of Inglewood High into one of the finest young character actresses and comedians in the industry. I am so proud. <laughs> Tim Conway defies description. His brain never slows down. Those little wheels are constantly churning out original chunks of genius that amaze us all. I think it is a credit to Tim that some of the giants in comedy today steal from him. Tim would never say that, but I can. And the fact that he is even nicer than he is talented is the best thing you could know about him. On behalf of all of us, I want to thank you here tonight and all of you who have been watching us for making these years possible. You brought us together, and we are all so very grateful. I love you.